Hi. Thank you very much uh, for having API Days. I'm, I'm really impressed with the fact that even with the strike, there's so many people still here, and I think that's such a credit to them. And also thank you to the audience, because without you, I'd be speaking to empty chairs. Um, my name is Nathaniel Akenwa, um, and I'm a developer evangelist at Twilio. How many of you have heard about Twilio? Quite a few people in this room. OK, so for those of you who don't know, Twilio is a cloud communication platform. And we make APIs that make it easy for developers to integrate telecommunications into their applications, whether that's WhatsApps, SMSs, video calls, you name it, any form of communication. And I am part of the developer network in Twilio. And every week, we have a meeting. And in our weekly meeting, we um, show this slide. And it's our mission, and I'll read it. Our mission is to inspire and equip developers to fuel the future of communications. And nearly every action that we do at Twilio, we remind ourselves, does this fulfill this mission? And I really want to focus on the word equip. Yeah. There we go. I'm going to focus on the word equip. Now, why is this our priority? Now, we are a company in a capitalist world, right? And in a capitalist world, our goal is to make money. And to make money, we need to sell more API calls. And to sell more API calls, we need to make sure that the developers who are using our APIs are equipped with the information they need to use them effectively in whatever they're building. And documentation is one of the ways that we achieve this goal. But documentation can sometimes be a complex and confusing world. There are so many different formats, and it can often be confusing choosing which ones to prioritize. And I often see amazing products that are lightning quick and just secured like a fortress and available all the time, but their documentation just doesn't do them justice. And it oftentimes, especially when I was um, more of a junior developer, um, it left me com confused and unsure of how to new move forward. And in this talk, I'd like to break down the advantages of different types of documentation and how to strategically balance them to um, maximize impact. And I'm going to compare documentation to a healthy, balanced diet. We need a little bit of everything at the right times and in the right quantities. And I'm also going to showcase some of my favorite forms of documentation um, and show some examples. So before we begin, I know in the world of tech, we often hear these buzzwords like artificial intelligence. Um, but I think that technology will always revolve around people. People will use your product. And based on this experience, people will either choose to keep using your products or move on to something else. And in order to create documentation, we really need to focus on what these people, what their motivations are. And we need to figure out why. Why are these developers um, looking at our documentation? And why do we as developers, because oftentimes um, technical writers and those of us who are curating documentation, we're developers ourselves. So let's look inwards and ask ourselves, why do we look at documentation? And usually there's many different reasons, but they usually end up in one of these three categories. Either we're new to something, and oftentimes you just start to build a new product and you want to use a new technology or you want to learn about a new technology and maybe see if you can implement it into something that you already are building. And oftentimes it's when we're stuck. We've hit a problem and we need to solve it in order to continue moving forward. And the third one is we forgot. How many of you have uh, forgotten? You know that there is a piece of syntax that does an exact thing, and you've forgotten, and you had to Google it. Just show of hands. And if you didn't put your hand up, you might be lying. <laughs> so all of these people, they need some information to overcome that barrier, that problem that they're facing, in order to build whatever they're building. And in each of these three categories, we need to make sure that our documentation strategy addresses each of them. And we also need to understand that so many different people have different preferred methods of learning. And sometimes the different preferred methods of learning change depending on which group they currently are in. 
And really, this brings us to one thing. We need variety. We need balance. Now, balance is a key word that's going to come back up during this talk. And before I move on, how many of you, if you think back to school, remember the food pyramid? Quick show of hands. Yeah, we all remember the food pyramid. And my favorite part is the triangle right at the top, right? Snickers bars are my favorite. Um, and, and from the food pyramid, we can see that we need a variety of everything, so many different things in order to thrive. And as documentation, documentarians, we are the nutritionists cooking up meals of documentation for our developers who are visiting our developer portals. And we want to make sure that we have all of these different types to make sure that they have a healthy documentation experience. And another thing we can look at from the food pyramid is there is a sort of a hierarchy. Now, this hierarchy isn't there in terms of importance. I would very, very heavily argue that cookies are more important than broccoli. But uh, in the food pyramid, it's a hierarchy of usually quantities. So usually they say that you should eat on a plate. You should have more of the things towards the bottom and less of the things towards the top. Um, <coughs> So what we're going to do in this talk, what we're going to do is we're going to build a documentation pyramid. And like the food pyramid, this documentation period doesn't, pyramid doesn't mean that a layer at the bottom is more important than a layer at the top. Um, I'm just putting it in this order to sort of prioritize where you should focus. And let's start with the first layer. I like to call it minimum viable documentation. And this layer is the bedrock of any good documentation strategy. And if you don't execute this layer well, oftentimes people leave your product or your site after not being there for long. Um, and the good thing about this is when you do this well, lots of your other documentation will sprout or be connected back to this layer. And before I move on, I just want to say I'm not going to dive too deeply into any of these different formats, uh, because each one of them could be a talk on their own. Um, I will just gloss over some of their strengths and who they might be really useful to. So we're going to start with the good old reference manual. Um, and I like to think of it as being full of definitions and like a dictionary. And it's really important because it forms the foundation of your documentation. Many of the other pieces of documentation will link back to it. And this is very useful, just like a dictionary. And it needs to be comprehensive. So there should not be anything in your API that does not in some way exist in your manual. Think of it as the source of truth. And it's good for everyone, but it's extremely good for two of those groups, the person who's stuck and needs to just focus on some little details, or the person who just forgot something and just needs to find that answer really, really quickly. And there's obviously lots of techniques and tools you can use to generate your reference manual, but it's very important and it must be there. And I think uh, Twitter has a really good um, reference manual. I really like um, the way it's laid out and I can find everything really easily. So, uh, next we have the quick start. So the quick start, it assumes zero knowledge. And it's a step-by-step -step instruction showing the developer how to get started. And it builds a basic isolated use case. And very important, I say basic and isolated. Your quick start shouldn't show someone how to make a production-ready, massive piece of code that connects to everything else. It should show the most basic use of your API, usually the most popular use. Um, and it should be, I like to say, you should aim it at hackathon attendees. So someone who's in a 24 or 48 hour hackathon, they don't want to spend ages learning so much information in order to build something. They would like to be able to get something off the ground really, really quickly. And that's the goal with a quick start, to be able to impart this knowledge and get them going very, very fast. It's also important to have multiple language coverage, so different people who are using different tools can definitely use that quick start to get moving. 
And it's really good for the person who is new. And I think we at Twilio, this is one of the things that we actually are quite good at. We like to say that with, after signing up for a Twilio account, within 10 minutes, you should be able to send your first SMS. And being able to give the developer that small win, that feeling when it works for the first time, they are more likely to come back to your documentation and say, oh, this is a great product. It was so easy to get started, and I can build and iterate from there. And next, we have advanced tutorials and samples. Now, these solve common issues, and they help to build sample applications. And they are extra guidance, like different maps after starting a journey. And um, they are for developers who are already building your, using your product. So this isn't for someone who's just getting started and has never heard about it before. These are some of the problems that people are all going to have to address when using their products. I often think that an authentication guide or use case sample should be here because these are things that everyone who is using your product is going to run into. So you might as well have documentation to make sure that they can all solve this. And this is really good for the people who are new, but also sometimes the people who are stuck. They will go back to these guides and see what was the recommended way of dealing with this problem. And, and I think that the Stripe API is really, really nice pros um, that deals with this. So we have the first layer. And we move on to what I call the second layer. I call this one key pillars. And now the key pillars, they are still very important. And oftentimes, if I'm looking at a product and I do not see things from the key pillars layer, I I'm not necessarily so excited to use that product. And I'm not trying to say that they are not as important as the first layer, but oftentimes these need a bit more um, interaction with your users. So the first one I'm going to talk about are FAQs. Now, I know some people may say that FAQs aren't necessarily documentation, and, and, but I really think they are. Why? Because they equip users in some way. And these must be driven by user feedback. I know a lot of people sometimes, they sit in a room and they say, okay, developers, what are some questions that you think that other developers will ask? No, you should have FAQs that are actually fed by feedback. And don't make up questions. Give concise answers. Remember the person who is stuck? They need to be able to find this and be like, bang, I have my answer and link to other documentation. Now, a lot of times you may think, oh yeah, no, I definitely did answer this question in my documentation. If you go to this page and you go down to the third paragraph, look at that line, there's the answer. Sometimes they want to be able to find that answer really, really quickly when they're stuck. And a good documentation strategy will realize what are these common issues and let me just give them a quick answer and then link to that longer form documentation. And this is, a good example of this is Stack Overflow. I know Stack Overflow isn't necessarily attached to one product, but their model of answering questions is just the perfect FAQ. Um, and I often say that you should have some people who pay attention to what goes on here. So move on. I like to call this an API Explorer. Now, different people have different names, and no name is better than the other. You have API Console or different things. and. The thing about it is that it mirrors the live product. And when I say mirrors the live product, it even mirrors the errors that you would get if you make a mistake. And it's really important because it's an experimentation tool. It allows developers to be able to try out new things really quickly without having to build up a large amount of infrastructure. And it's a quick feedback cycle. So the developers are able to learn and move forward and iterate and continue to grow. And this is really important because when you're, when you're moving forward or when a developer is stuck, they will oftentimes turn over to your API Explorer and say, am I generating the same requests as, as this? Or am I getting similar responses? Or what is the response that I should expect? And one of my favorite APIs that I sometimes play around with is Marvel. Uh, and the Marvel API, when you click on them, you can fill out and create a sample request and see what a response would be like. And I really like the way that they have done that. 
So the next thing I think you need is communication channels. Now, this is not support. So support is slightly separate. But you have manned and unmanned channels. Uh, and, and the reason I think that you really need that this at this stage is you need to be able to give quicker information back to your users. So uh, this offers transparency. And this might be a change log or API status. And I believe that then some people say they're not documentation, but they do equip developers with information they need at any one point to get past one of those three roadblocks. One thing I would hate is, and it's happened to me, where I've been working on a problem for an hour and then found out that the service was down or something had happened or changed and I did not know. And you need to have some way of communicating that in your developer portal. And it iterates faster than your docs. And one thing, um, that I think we, that I know of a documentation um, strategy that they do is they have a, a star rating system next to any page of documentation. And if you give less than three stars, um, immediately someone jumps in and tries to help you answer your question. And that, because of that, they're able to get that quick communication. So we've made up these layers. Now, when we move on, we're going to have what I call engaging offerings. And this is where we really blur the lines between documentation and engagement strategy. But I think it's important that we understand that the purpose of documentation, when we went back to the start, was to equip. And one of these is a developer blog. And oftentimes, people will say it's for um, engagement, not, doc not education. And I appreciate their opinion, but I often see many examples of corporate blog posts that are made to give extra information to developers that will help them build with the tools. Um, and these should have a personal voice and be a source of inspiration to people looking at new ways to use your tools. And they shouldn't be limited to your product. So the, one of the highest, um, highest um, performing blog posts at Twilio is a blog post about HTTP headers. Now, HTTP headers aren't limited to Twilio, and people who don't use Twilio will need to write HTTP HTTP headers, but every single developer who's using Twilio needs to be aware of the HTTP headers um, that they are sending and receiving. So it's really important to sometimes flesh out things that aren't directly your product, but are really important to developers who will be using it. And video content, this is another format that is really popular. And I think we need to make sure that we understand that video content in the world of documentation is content and not advertising. So it needs to some way give information to developers to help them to use your product. And it comes in multiple formats. Sometimes they're short videos that show you how to do something with um, code, and sometimes they're in longer form. And they should often have a call to action or a link to your documentation somewhere else. You must have this thread of interconnectedness in all of your documentation. And one of my favorite pieces of video is actually the Boring Flutter development show. And what they do is, um, for about an hour, developers from Flutter will build something. They will build an app using Flutter. And all the problems that they run into, they will go, they will not edit it, they will work through them and then talk about how they got over it. And oftentimes it's nice because you might find a problem that they solved in the video and you can skip forward a little bit because um, in the comments they often tell you where the answer is and find the solution. So we've got this pyramid built up and now we're at my favorite thing, bit, uh, the cherries on top of our documentation cake. And here, is where you can begin to have lots of fun. And you can build, I've seen so many different forms of documentation that are really creative and go out there, but they still serve the purpose of equipping developers and giving them some information to help them use the products. And at Twilio, we, we launched something called Twilio Quest. Um, and Twilio Quest is a fully functioning RPG that teaches people how to use Twilio. So you can download it on nearly any platform, and it's, you can walk around in the world, it's a bit dark, and it's got an inbuilt coding editor, and you do a mission to hack open a terminal, and you send your SMS, and you could literally copy that code into your IDE and run it, and it would work. But we are, yes, we're giving people a fun time, and yes, it's cool to uh, work all day by playing through missions as testing, but I'm equipping developers whenever I do that. So we've built out this 
um, documentation period. Now, I would like to highlight something. You can see that there's a decent bit of variety to give you a comprehensive documentation strategy. But let's go back to our food pyramid. Now, quick question, is there anyone in the audience who is vegan? Your diet might look something like this. And I tried the keto diet. Has anyone tried a ketogenic diet? I tried it, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. <laughs> but uh, your diet might look like this. And you can see how already in this room, there's so many people where we change our diets around and we all have different things. Now let's look at some of them pick athletes. Uh, this is a, a Turkish javelin thrower, Fatih Avan, and he's 23. And if you look at the food, he has, he has steak, he has lots of peanuts, bananas, my favorite fruit, a large and lots of protein to get energy, to produce lots of power, right? And then you have another athlete, and she's a taekwondo fighter, Nur Tata, and she has a very, very different diet. Um, oftentimes, she has to meet a weight limit before her fights. Now, she's not any less of an athlete um, like the person before, but we can see that there's so much variation, and they needed to personalize their diets. And the important thing is to tailor your documentation strategy to your audience. Now, I'm not the expert of your audience. You know so much more about the developers using your products than I do. Um, and you need to take the documentation pyramid and manipulate it until it's right for you. This is Max, and he's my personal trainer. And every three months, Max, I do a fitness test, and I send some body measurements, and then Max goes, okay, Nathaniel, this is what you need to do for the next three months, and these are foods I'd like you to try and eat, this is how many calories I want you to hit, this is how much protein, da 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 And in order for him to do that, he needs those measurements, otherwise it won't really be personalized and tailored to me. He'll just be a trainer, not a personal trainer. And it's important that you, to tailor your documentation strategy to your audience, you need to take some of those measures in order to make those decisions about what to focus on and maybe what to leave out. And here are some examples of some measurements. Now, this isn't conclusive, and there's probably a lot more out there, but these are some easy wins you can start collecting. Uh, one of the best ones is blind testing, and what we do is we often say, well, here, go and build something. Build this using our, we'll find a developer and say, build this using our, um, our products. And you are not allowed to ask for any help. You just need to read the documentation. And we will ask them to, we'll watch their screens and see what they're looking at. And it's so frustrating, actually, when you see them looking at the answer, but they scroll past it and move on, right? But that can often highlight maybe where there's inconsistencies or where you are putting the information in the wrong place and show you where you need to move things around and where to focus on. Another thing you should do is use website analytics. So track where does the documentation start from? Where do they land? Which documentations do they go through? Oftentimes, this is why it's really good to link your documentation between each other. You can track their journey, and you can almost see the problem that they're trying to solve and be like, ah, oh, this is where they found a solution. Is there any way I can move this over here or make it easier to get there? Another thing you should do is collect feedback. Now, this is really obvious, but a lot of people fail to do it. And don't just collect feedback um, in a, 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 with developers who are really engaged, but also sometimes just leave opportunity for people to just rate your documentation out of a couple of stars. And then you'll see, OK, these documentation, everyone leaves this documentation page very happy. Or people leave this documentation page very frustrated. And you'll notice that people often very gladly rate your page when they're frustrated. I don't know why, it just pops out more. Um, and also monitor support requests. Now, support, again, is it's a separate world. But you need to go and look at our support. What questions are you constantly ask, answering? What questions do people constantly come to you with? And is that something that is so generic I could easily um, highlight it more in my documentation? Is there something I'm missing or something that's in the wrong place? And these are the measures that you can use to go back and figure out where things need to be. And this reminds us that we need balance. We need a bit of everything all the time. Thank you very much for listening. I'm Nathaniel Kemmer. You can find me on Twitter at ChatterboxCoder. And thank you.
Thank you. Are there any questions? All right, then. Thank you very much.